Hmm, g'day Tragic here, and welcome back to Wrath of the Righteous. This is going to be the deck building video between our scenarios. We just completed the Godless Ones, which was awesome. And uh, it's been a big break because I've been working on the mod. Uh, the mod's sort of ready for the next lot of testing, so I'm going to play the next... Uh, you know, the next scenario, which is the Elven Entanglement. But before we do that, we need to build our decks. Now, what the way deck building works in Pathfinder is a little bit different to how deck building works in a lot of other games. And what I mean is the card pool that you have has to be created out of the existing global card pool or you know what i call the vault i think it's got another name technically so what i'm saying is in say magic the gathering or an lcg or whatever i could just save this 21 card deck or whatever deck i make import it into them into a new game and start playing but in pathfinder all the cards that are in this deck have to be removed from this global card pool Okay, so you've got to construct the decks out of the global card pool each scenario. And as scenarios get added, like, you know, so Herald of the Labyrinth, you add more cards to this card pool. And that's, uh, that's a, sort of makes it a little bit trickier on how to create these, uh, these, uh, these decks. So I built a deck builder in the other mod, and I'm going to import our current card pool and our current player card pool into that mod. Now I also just need to grab the uh, the actual characters we're using. Now I'm gonna just introduce you to a little house rule I have. So the, the whole point of this game is that you get your characters and you play them and even if you fail the quests, you still get to keep the cards that you've discovered, the boons that you pick up. So slowly your characters get more powerful, you level up, you get special skills and it sort of simulates an RPG kind of thing. The problem with that is that if you want to try a new character or play with a new character, you kind of have to start from scratch and it's really annoying. You have two card pools when you're doing between scenarios. Every single character has can make a new deck out of their existing cards, but they're also free to trade any card with any other character. So what that basically means is that you have a player card pool made out of all the decks that existed at the end of the scenario. So we've got all these decks here form a single pool of cards. And then in addition, we can choose at this stage to add any card from the global card pool that has the basic trait, like say Potion of Striding has the basic trait. I can put that in any deck I want, even if we don't have any in our existing player pool. So my little house rule is that if I ever swap in a new character, no matter what, I can just use the player pool that I have to make his deck. So say I'm three scenarios in, I might have some really good cards in here. I could pull in a character and I can just make a deck out of just completely normally, just make a deck out of the player pool. And if I need any extras, I can pull the basics out of the, out of the main Thing. It just makes it a little bit easier to, you know, it just makes it a little bit easier to to swap in and out new characters. It, you can technically abuse it, like, oh, I've got a really good weapon, I'll bring in this character just so he can use it. I'm not going to do, obviously, I'm not going to abuse it like that, but uh, I am going to swap out a character. And the reason is, when we first started, uh, I was, uh, we, we chatted about it on, on, on the comments, and there was some worry that we were a bit low on arcane so i swapped in anora to replace who i originally picked which was hask and there is a problem with this our our uh, team has basically no dexterity abilities at all we've got dexterity four dexterity six dexterity four dexterity six dexterity six dexterity four so we've got no stealth we've got no acrobatics we've got no ranged we're really lacking any kind of dexterity so what we want to try and do we're going to swap one of these characters out for someone with good dexterity and i've had a look at some of the characters and there's basically three i'm interested in there's hask hask is the one that i originally had there's Amarakra, 
who is uh, like a half orc girly, and there's Anduin, which is uh, like a, a human huntress kind of person. And these are the three people. So basically, uh, Hask, he has ranged dexterity. He's got constitution and fortitude. He also has perception and survival. Very, very cool. He's only got 6-1 for those things, but he still has them. And the reason why they're important is because there's a number of things we really need to keep an eye on in our deck building process. For starters, we need to keep an eye on Fiendish Tree. We need to keep an eye on the Servitor, which is the Demoling. Uh, so we definitely have to keep an eye on both of these cards. This guy needs a Perception 7 or a Wisdom to actually only have to do a combat of 8, which is a huge deal. So anything that's got Wisdom or Perception is a bonus. And also this person here, well, this one we'll talk about later, but basically we need people who have the ability to fire. But the point is the Fiendish Tree comes from a Boreal Blight. It's on the top here, this barrier. And there's a number of these horrible barriers. We actually have one, two, there's two Boreal Blights in the deck. And there's a number of other really nasty, uh, see this one, Dexterity Acrobatics to get past this barrier, you know? This one is stealth to get past this one. Bayful Shadows. Wow, that's a horrible one. My point is that we kind of need to keep an eye on a couple of things. We want ways to avoid Bane. So if a barrier comes up, we can ignore it. You know, shuffle it back into the deck or whatever. We want a way to preferably peek at our deck so we can see them coming. And we would really like... Uh, you know, ways to win the perception or the wisdom check on the demon link. So they're the three things I'm looking for in character stats. So let's have a quick look at what we've got here. This guy, he's got the perception here, which is a six plus one, which means he still needs to roll a six to pass. So that's pretty hard. Now he's got a pretty average ranged but he doesn't have any other range skills. And because we've got no other characters with range skills, I don't think he's really that great a pick, even though I love his ability of being able to help other people with their battles. This person's a little more interesting. Dexterity, acrobatics, dexterity ranged, also has divine wisdom, also has perception. Okay, so he needs a five to pass those perception checks. And he also has Divine Wisdom, which allows him to cast Divine Spells, which is awesome. And the reason why that is awesome is because if we look in the spell thing here, there is a Divine Spell called Fireblade, which is basic, which means you can put it in any deck, and it has the Fire trait. Okay, Any spell that has the Fire trait will add an extra D8 to this tree which is a big deal. Now, what's interesting about a Boreal Blight is that only the person who draws the barrier needs to defeat it. So unlike some of the other barriers, if you can evade the monster that gets summoned, if you can evade the summoned monster and you're not the person who actually discovered the barrier, then it doesn't affect whether you pass the barrier or not. So it's, if the... It, if you can use a, what I'm saying is for the, for that boreal bite, you can use evades as well. But anyway, so this is a pretty good character. Now let's have a look at the abilities. So for starters, she has a heal, which is good. We've already got a dedicated heal, but it's or having an extra heal is good. And this says, if your combat check has the sword trait, add two, and you may add the magic trait. Now see where it says D4, that's a typo. That should just be a little box that you can upgrade to D4. And you can upgrade it to also add the fire trait, which is awesome, which means that she can have an automatic sword fire attack, which would be awesome against these trees. And we also have Anduin or Anduin or whatever. She has ranged at a 12 plus one. She has stealth at a 12 plus two. She also has Divine Wisdom, and she also has Survival. 
So out of all the characters, she's the most rounded. She has excellent stealth, excellent range. And it basically means that acrobatics is the only thing we don't have. So I'm kind of thinking she is the one to get. She also has a pretty damn good ability. At the start of your turn, you may search your deck or your discard pile for a cohort and put it into your hand, then recharge each card. That means she can constantly have her cohorts up and using the discard, the more powerful discard power rather than just the reveal power and just constantly keep them in the hand plus recharging uh, dead cards. Very, very strong. But maybe even more powerful is you may recharge a card to evade a summoned bane. So this means that she will be uh, able to to completely avoid Fiendish Trees as long as she's not the one who actually found the Blight. So she's a very, very strong character. I love the fact that this girl has automatic fire trait on her weapons and is a healer, but I really think that what we're going to go with here is Anduin because she has both ranged stealth, divine, and survival and she's coming in at a plus 12 dexterity as well. So she's very strong at those things. Excellent. So that is the plan. We're going to grab those people. So the question now becomes, who are we going to kick off the team? Remember, we had Balazar and we had Nora. And we had Kyra. Well, we're definitely not getting rid of Kyra because Kyra is a legion. Where's that other deck? There's a deck missing. I think I've screwed up. Okay, whatever. I'll have to fix it up. I'll finish doing what I'm doing here and then I'll just quickly redo it. Anyway, so who are we going to kick off? Now, basically, I think Anora turned out to be excellent. She has so much gas and her ability to recharge... You know, to basically recharge random spells from a discard pile means that she just, you know, never runs out of gas. You saw at the end of the game, she was absolutely kicking still because she was the only one with gas at the end of the round, at the end of the game last time because everyone else had run out of gas, but she kept recharging all the cards. So she was always drawing powerful attack spells. So I really like the fact that she was a strong finisher, so I want to keep her in the game. The other person we have is Balazar. Now, I really like Balazar because Balazar has this sort of summoning ability, which I find really fun. Uh, it sort of ate through a lot of cards, and it needs to be upgraded to really, you know, really go off. But the good thing is, is that He's kind of like Sione in Wrath of Rune Lords, as in he doesn't require anything in his hand to be good at attacking. He doesn't need spells. He doesn't need weapons. He can basically attack anything at any time, which means he's always up for the fight, which is also very, very cool. Uh, I really like uh, Anora's skills here as well. We're definitely keeping Kara for the healing. So the question is, what about our melee? We have quite a top-heavy melee. So we've got strength melee, we've got strength melee, we've got strength melee, fortitude, 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 you know, constitution, I should say. But the point is, these are all kind of similar melee characters here. So which one are we going to get rid of and replace? Or do we want to get rid of Balazar? So that the choices at the moment is Balazar or one of these ones. So let's have a quick look at Alan. Alan has this ability here that I didn't use at all last game, which is you may discard a card to add one plus its adventure deck number to the check to defeat a non-villain monster. And if it's undefeated, you put it on the top of the location deck. This is extremely strong. Basically, as you go through the scenario, we're playing B, so it's only going to be one, but... If we were playing the Midnight Isles, which is scenario four, that's plus five to the combat check to kill it, to kill the monster. So a lot of the a lot of the abilities in Pathfinder, the card game, kind of lose a bit of their potency as the game continues on. You know, they they don't, they become less and less powerful because that's like a diminishing returns or something. 
This ability here doesn't diminish. It actually gets stronger as you go on. I mean, if you put the extra point into it, it's plus two. So if I was playing, if I was playing City of Locus with plus two, I would have plus eight to combat. Plus eight to combat, plus whatever I'm rolling with my abilities and my weapons, you know. I mean, that's a huge, huge bonus. So I actually really like him. I want to see that in action, so I want to keep him. As for Crow, Crow has some interesting things. He can bury a card to add 1d10 and the electricity or the force trait to any chank, strength, or melee check, or an arcane check. If the check has the attack trait, you may recharge the card instead. So basically what he's saying is he can recharge or bury cards to add a d10 to various things. Very strong. If you defeat a monster, you may move or put the bottom card in your deck on the top of your deck. So if you're paying attention to what you're recharging, you'll be able to constantly redraw the same cards and then constantly recharge them and then redraw, recharge, redraw. So he's got a lot of utility here. Plus a D10, an extra D10 on attacks is awesome. He has only got light armors though, which is a bit of a bummer. But he also has a D12-1 melee and he's got five weapons. You know, he's, he's, he's a good character. We also have Sheila, who has a plus three melee, uh, got a decent charisma. She actually has divine wisdom as well. But what is interesting about her is that she has a couple of things going on here. For starters, because she's a paladin, she can't take corrupted cards at all, which is a bit of a bummer. They have to bury them. So both Sheila and Crow have burying, uh, card burying things. But remember, burying cards isn't actually that bad because you're still going to be able to use it during the deck building even if she can't use it during the game. But she can discard the top card of her deck to add 1d6 to any check by a character at the location. So it's very similar to Crow's ability except it adds a d6 instead of a d10 and it can help other people at the location. And uh, you actually... The big difference is that it doesn't have that recursion thing going on. And the other big difference is that in a six-player game, I mean, you saw we're basically spread out constantly. So unless we get a really early close, it's off, we're not often going to be standing at the same location. So that ability isn't really as good as it sounds. The other good ability is that she can use a Charisma instead of Listed Skills, and her Charisma is a D10 plus 1. That means she can use a D10 plus 1 for pretty much anything, including Dexterities or whatever. So it doesn't even say... It just says, Attempt a Check. It doesn't even have anything to do with Boons or Banes. Anything I can use my Charisma on, which is awesome. So that she also kind of gets around... The, de the dexterity problem we were having before. So, I'm thinking I'm going to replace Balazar. I really, really like Balazar, though. I, I, I want to keep Balazar. Like, I, I kind of feel like the best one to get rid of is Crow. But, I mean, yeah, Crow or Sheila. But I'm going to get rid of Balazar. Because... We need heavy hitters. We need heavy hitters. And he, uh, he, we had real problems with, because he's drawing six cards and you're constantly, constantly discarding cards because of his abilities. So, I don't know. But I do love the fact that he doesn't need weapons. He doesn't need items to hit things. I don't know. I think I'm just going to... Yeah, I think I'm going to get rid of him. So I'm going to put in Anduin to replace Balazar. Now, there was a bit of a screw up when I imported the deck. I didn't import one of the decks. Uh, so I've got to go grab that other deck. So I'm just going to quickly do that and I'll be right back. And I've got the heroes that I want to use. So let's load up the deck editor and fetch our heroes. And let's get into this. In addition, we'll also need... Uh, any promo cards that are for Eowyn. She's got that one. 
than that one. Oh, and also this is another thing. Uh, this is an error. I actually do have a, a iconic card for Kyra. So I'll stick that in the pool as well. Also, she comes with her own cohort. So I'll just stick that in the pool as well. Okay. So I'm gonna stop this video here and put the deck building in another video because this video is getting a bit long. It's already 20 minutes and I, all I've done is uh, picked up my decks basically. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, let's put a pause on this and uh, give me time to go do other things instead of spending four hours editing. Okay, I will see you guys.